Duran? If no one else will go, Chris would like to make a comment. Um, sure, Chris. I, I don't see anyone else, so okay. He'll still show up. I see Amy. Cynthia has her hands up. Okay. Okay, Joanne. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Uh, my name is Chris Parrish, and I am a retired infection prevention nurse. I think the Academy of Music should be applauded for their new policy that patrons must show proof of vaccination and wear a mask when attending performances. But I take issue with the additional allowance for accepting a negative COVID test performed within the last 72 hours. As we all know, a negative COVID test is not a guarantee that the individual does not have COVID. The Academy's policy does not indicate what method of test testing must be used. Some antigen tests identify only 50 to 60% of positives in asymptomatic but infectious individuals. Also, how carefully material is collected from the nose or throat can influence the accuracy of the test, with home tests likely to be less accurate than when collected by professionals. I think accepting a negative COVID result without any qualifiers is essentially meaningless. Serving snacks and drinks during performances, which the Academy plans to do, means that individuals who tested negative but are actually positive and infectious will be removing their masks in order to eat their snacks. Gateway City <coughs> Arts in Holyoke and the Shea Theater in Montague are only accepting proof of vaccination as well as requiring masks. There are no exceptions for COVID tests. The Commonwealth is now requiring proof of vaccination for state employees. Daycare workers, nursing home employees, many college and university students are all required to show proof of vaccination. None of them are offering a negative COVID test as an alternative. The Academy is a city owned public building and I recommend that the health department consider requiring proof of vaccination for all indoor public venues and eliminate a negative COVID test as sufficient for entry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy, Amy Wilson, Kayleen. Raising my hand. I'm happy did to say Did you raise your something. hand? No. Oh, somebody did, an Amy. Is there another Amy? I don't think it's me. Okay, um, then Cynthia. Where we have to unmute you. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. This is also this is about masks. Um, I don't have a health background. I did work in a munis large municipal government. Um, I live in a. I'm a renter in an apartment house, and I feel that we in, in, are entitled to the same protections as everybody else in the city. Should not be up to our landlords to determine whether unmasked people are running around in the building trying to get on elevators with us, using the laundry room, picking up their mail. Uh, I think it's absurd for them to be able to call it private property. In Thorns Market, they can't call it private property and, and the stores can't stop the, or the mandate from making them have people masked. In office buildings, people are masked in the common areas. It's exactly the same thing. And we did not, you know, because you don't own your own home means you are still entitled to the protection of the Northampton Health Department. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first, D. Prue, and then Ruth Briggs. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm David Prue, the athletic director at Northampton High School, and I just want to talk about the portion of the mass requiring the possibility of requiring mass for uh, outdoor sports, um, including football. Um, going with what the MIAA and DESE came out with today, um, and they are not requiring mass. Uh, for outdoor sports. Um, I'm really concerned about the amount of physical exertion with the heat and humidity on a day like today, asking our student athletes to put forth, um, you know, the amount of exertion needed uh, to productively practice and play and having to, you know, have those masks on during play when it's something it's not being required um, at the MIA level, at the high school level, 
not being required at the collegiate level. And I came from Western New England University and they work with, um, you know, a, a large board of medical staff when determining, you know, what their policies are. Uh, I'm all for masking on the sideline if that's what we want to do, uh, you know, spacing, pushing vaccination rates. Um, but uh, when, when it's not in this past spring, um, you know, the decisions were based uh, out of what the MIAA was requiring in this past spring when I started in the position towards the end of the year, um, when that masking mandate was lifted, um, it lifted for us as well. And so I'm wondering why, um, you know, we're going away from following what our, um, you know, our, our athletic um, associations in collaboration with medical individuals are, are requiring. And, um, you know, we won't be masking when we go to other towns. We don't, have, because the MAIAA is not um, requiring this, I feel like it's also from a home game standpoint would be putting us in a tough situation as far as oversight of visiting teams when they do not have to mask, officials who will not be enforcing mask mandates because it's not a part of our playing rules. Um, and I would just like, uh, you know, masking on the sidelines, distancing on the sidelines, you know, advocating vaccination rates and not, you know, I'm not sure what our um, high school population vaccination rate um, is compared to our peers. Um, but I just like to, you know, in the best interest of, you know, the, the health and safety of our student athletes, um, um, I am concerned um, about the exertion and the possibility of, um, you know, how they, how they react if they're forced to be playing while masked in this sort of Thank you so much. Climate. Yep. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Um, Ruth Briggs? We have to unmute you, I think. Well done. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, thank you for calling this meeting and having a public comment period. I'm speaking um, on behalf of the Northampton Jazz Festival. I'm the president of the nonprofit organization that's 10 years old. As you may or may not know, we are um, uh, preparing to launch the Jazz Festival uh, in 2021 on October 1, which is a Friday, and on October 2, which is a Saturday. Um, I also applaud the leadership of the Academy of Music and we plan to um, have music in various venues all around town. Um, I'm, I wanna make sure that um, the health department in particular knows about this um, because we uh, are planning on following the protocol of the Academy um, requiring masks and all, at all indoor performances as well as proof of vaccination um, that our volunteers will be checking everyone when they come in to the performances on Saturday. Um, I'm, I'm a little less certain, but I'm beginning to feel that on Saturday when there's music in the restaurants and breweries in town, that we may wanna do the same. We may want to check for everyone's vaccination status um, before they come in um, to listen to the music. So I just kind of wanted to put it out there and say that we are following the protocol of the Academy, although we are not going to be dealing with positive COVID, negative COVID tests um, because it's a non-ticketed event. So people will be coming um, with some, but not all knowledge um, that we would like them to have. So we are going to do the best to ensure that everyone is vaccinated when they come in to hear the performances. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ezekiel Baskin, hold on one second. We need to unmute you. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, first, I wanna say that I agree with Chris's comments and Cynthia's comments previously. Um, and I wanted to thank the Board of Health for putting this mask mandate in place. Um, I wanted to speak about the definition of performers item, which thank you for putting that on the agenda. Um, I um, work as a performing artist, theater director, um, and I just wanted to speak the, about that definition. It's very narrow right now in the current order, um, singers and musicians playing certain kinds of instruments. 
I just wanted to advocate for that exemption to be expanded to include actors, dancers, and circus artists and yo-yoers, um, as all of those are facial expressiveness is really vital in conveying the artistic messages of those kinds of performances. Um, it's really difficult to direct actors with their masks on um, and have the, the message come across effectively. Um, and singers and the, the woodwind instrumentalists are actually the most dangerous because of the amount of um, the way that they're spreading. So I, I would love for that exemption to be open um, to actors in non-musical performances, to dancers and to circus and yo-yo artists as well. Um, that said, one thing I would be in favor of would be tightening that exemption to only include vaccinated performers um, as another way of boosting vaccination rates. So I think if the kind of performers was an expanded category, but all performers were required to be vaccinated to fit under that exemption, that would be my preference. Um, and it would certainly make the sort of cultural and performing arts work that we're doing more possible, um, particularly as we get into the winter months and outdoor performance becomes harder and harder. Um, thank you for considering and thank you for everything that you're doing to keep Northampton safe. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, is there anyone else here for public comment? I don't see any other electronic hands. Anybody want to wave at us? Cynthia spoke already. Um, anybody else? Um, I don't see It looks like Cynthia else. wants to say another comment, Dr. Levin. One more minute, Cynthia. Can Hold you on, hear me? There, okay. there you go, go ahead. All right, I spoke very briefly. I just wanna add, um, I live in a building with an elevator. I live on the top floor, I'm disabled. I'm basically trapped in my apartment by unmasked people getting in and getting on the elevator. I get off when they get on. I'm doing that all the time. I try to avoid busy times. It's horrendous. It's just not right. It's just not right. I hope you can help us. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else here for public comment? I do not see any other hands up. I don't see any waves. Anybody? Anybody else? Vivian? You want to unmute? You ready for me? No. Um, you know what, first, first, I need to open the board meeting. OK. Um, so public comment session is closed. And now we will formally open the uh, Department of Public Health board meeting. It is 544. Um, tonight, we have all of our board members present. They are Cynthia Swopis, Laurent Levy, Suzanne Smith, and myself. And we also have uh, our DPH staff present, Meredith O'Leary, Vivian Franklin, Amy Hutchins, Kelly Constantine, and I'm not sure if I saw Katie Kelly. Not tonight. Um, okay. <laughs> um, we are recording this meeting. Um, and would someone like to make a motion to open the meeting? Motion to open the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. There we are. Okay, the meeting is now open. Um, I think I'd like to keep the minutes to the end. I know that Cynthia has to leave early, so I'd like to get rolling. Um, first, we'll have Vivian Franklin, our public health nurse, uh, reviewing briefly. Um, our current uh, COVID data. Thank you, Vivian. All right, I think I can get the screen share to work this time. Oh, why am I not a host so? You're not a host anymore? <laughs> not a host. I have to be a host on my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should be all set though. Fabulous. All right, let's try that again. Okay.
Okay, and I'm gonna put us in full screen and see how that goes. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Great. Yes. Okay, so here we are. Um, uh, the landscape has unfortunately changed drastically since the last time we met, just in the last two weeks. Um, last time we met, I was reporting 17 cases in the last 14 days. I'm now reporting 50 cases in the last 14 days. That brings our incidence rate up to 12.22 cases per day per 100,000 people. Um, and I, if you've been following too with the CDC COVID tracker, Hampshire County has now moved decidedly into substantial transmission for the county. Um, and you'll see on the right here, this is our cases in a more graphic form. Um, the blue lines represent cases reported per day and the orange line represents cumulative cases. So we've jumped up a little over 100 cases since um, this new wave of COVID-19 transmission began um, in the beginning of July. Vivian, this is Northampton or the county? So uh, um, this, the numbers, um, the case counts and the incidence rate and the graph, that's all Northampton. The transmission risk based on CDC metrics, um, that's just county level. So that's Hampshire. Okay. okay, and there's the map. It's not very pretty right now. Um, yep, so we've been in substantial transmission, I think since, um, was it Friday the 13th? If that makes sense. All right. Um, <laughs> Um, it doesn't show any signs of going down. If anything, cases are continuing to rise. Um, so this is as of the past seven days um, reported for Tuesday, this past Tuesday, the 24th. Um, and I always like to look at our age groups. Um, you'll notice that um, the majority of our cases right now are our age groups between 20 and 39 years old um, with lower cases reported for um, pretty much all other case groups, uh, or age groups, excuse me. Um, and if, that, you're in a, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, that's also the age group with the lower vaccination rate, is that true? That's harder, um, that's harder for me to have clearer data on, yes, for 20 to 29 year olds. However, when I look at age groups for um, vaccination rates, the age group that includes 30 year olds extends up to 49 year olds. So it's 30 to 49 <laughs> year olds. So it makes it a little harder to make that clear of a deduction, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely 20 to 29 year olds, 30 to 39 year olds are representative of a lot of our cases right now, um, which sort of makes sense considering, you know, um, who might be going out and doing um, higher risk activities and then also factoring in um, vaccination rates for, for those groups. Well, that should um, be in the smallest percentage bracket, 40 to 49. Yeah, if you're a 40 to 49 year old, I mean, you, they're pretty low for you, I guess, but they're definitely present. <laughs> um, so I know um, Dr. Levin wanted me to speak on clusters right now. We're not really seeing a lot of um, public place clusters right now. Um, a lot of the spread that's easiest to track, though, is going to be among workplace employees um, in uh, congregate care settings and in households, because that's just much easier to identify sources of um, exposure and transmission. Um, so what I can report on is um, based on what we find out from interviewing cases. So this is generally going to be a little bit underreported here. Um, I can report on what people are telling us they've done during the for COVID-19, which is still pretty valuable. Um, only 13% of cases interviewed had a known COVID-19 exposure during the incubation period, meaning that they knew and they were notified that they had been exposed. Um, 18% reported out of state or out of country travel. And I'm sorry, this is data for um, this current wave. So since the end of June, beginning of July, um, just to clarify that it looks a lot different as you look at different time periods and different surges over the pandemic. 28% um, reported visiting with friends and family. 20% um, of cases were reporting going to bars and restaurants. 7% um, reported working as a healthcare worker during that period. 
9% reported attending weddings or funerals, 8% uh, reported attending large public gatherings, and you know, 3% uh, reported um, personal services like hair salons or barbers. Um, so that's kind of areas where we might be seeing that risk for transmission is a little bit higher, which we kind of already know it, it, it makes sense. But we, just a question on this, we still really don't know we know that they did these activities, but we right. don't know if we, they got there, right? Because most so, people don't go to the hair salon and barber right. often unless they have to. And most people will see friends and family in, in a two week period. Okay. Yeah, and just to clarify this further, the data reported for um, like visiting with friends and family, visiting bars and restaurants, um, attending weddings and funerals, we only collect that data if they're reporting to us that they have no idea um, how they yeah. were. Um, so a lot of people are telling us that they don't know how they caught COVID, but a good 13% um, have a known, a known source of exposure. Um, and then I reported on breakthrough cases last time. This is also an area that has changed dramatically because we've had more cases now. Um, we're seeing probably about, I think, when I calculated earlier today, we've had new cases reported since then, unfortunately, but um, about a 50-50 split uh, in terms of prevalence, unvaccinated versus fully vaccinated cases. And when you look at that, that looks bad for vaccines. However, um, what we need to remember is that um, I think over two thirds of our population is fully vaccinated. That data is to come in this next slide or a slide after, but, um, the incidence of infection is really important to look at for unvaccinated versus fully vaccinated people. The incidence of infection in the last two weeks was two and a half times higher for unvaccinated people when compared to um, fully vaccinated people. 11% of our cases since June have been hospitalized. 2.2% um, of our cases since June have died from COVID-19. Uh, whereas 2.3% of our cases since June have been hospitalized, our um, vaccine breakthrough cases have been hospitalized and 0% have died. So um, the vaccines are still doing what they're supposed to be doing is what we can interpret from that data. They're still preventing um, severe illness and deaths. Um, we are pretty much still at the same exact percentages that we were for vaccine coverage, we know that it's kind of stagnated now um, in terms of increasing vaccination rates. So 76% uh, of our Northampton population have at least one dose. Um, and that is 83% of our eligible, our 12 plus population has at least one dose. 68%, so over two thirds, 68% of our population is fully vaccinated. And that's 75% of our eligible population is now fully vaccinated. In Northampton. Um, these rates are a little bit lower for Hampshire County. Um, as you can see here, 64% have received one dose in Hampshire County and only 58% of Hampshire County is fully vaccinated. Um, statewide, it's 71% have received at least one dose and 65% um, are fully vaccinated. I'm reading these out because I do realize some of you are um, calling in on the phone. Any questions about that slide? Keep going. <laughs> okay. um, and here are age groups for um, vaccination rates. And you'll see what I'm talking about here. It's a bit difficult because they don't um, parse out the 30 to 39 year olds versus 40 to 49 year olds. Um, so we're kind of stuck with looking at 30 to 49 year olds as an age group, which they do have a pretty exceptional vaccination rate. Um, I believe it's 82% are fully vaccinated. Um, our 12 to 15 year olds, of course, are still stealing the show in terms of our teenagers. Um, and our 16 to 19 year olds and our 20 to 29 year olds continue to have the lowest vaccination rates. And I can bring up the exact numbers if anybody's interested for fully vaccinated among each age group. Okay. I think we're good, Viv. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, that's what I have for data tonight. Um, are there oh. overall questions? Thank you so much. Any questions for Vivian? No, this is very helpful. Thank you. Really great.
Thank you so much, Vivian. All right. How do I get? Um, so now we have <clears throat> we have before us a draft of uh, potential recommendations for uh, changes to the uh, mask order that we did last time. Um, this is these are just recommendations. This is not a done deal. Um, and what I thought we would do is go through um, this document. The most up-to-date document was the one sent by Meredith at 4.30 this afternoon. I hope you all have that one. It has some minor changes to it. Um, and I thought we'd sort of start with the most meaningful part of this document and then go back to the other sections. And what I'd like to do is start on the second page Section three, policies and procedures, because that is more the meat of um, what we want to talk about. And I'll read it. And what I'd, I'd like to do, if we can, is sort of get a straw poll as we go along. And then after we finish a section, maybe we could have, uh, if someone wants to make a motion, that would be the time to do that. Is that reasonable? Yep. Um, so for policies and procedures, um, I'll read how it starts. Except as specified in section four, this is section three, masks shall be required regardless of vaccination status for those over the age of two years old as follows. Uh, we changed the age of five, um, which was in some older DPH regs to the age of two, which is what the CDC recommends. Number one, masks or face coverings shall be worn in all specified indoor spaces in the city of Northampton. This is different from the original order in that we, um, it now says specified indoor spaces rather than indoor public spaces so that we could actually be more specific about those spaces. Um, so if we go up to section two under definition, that's where we find the definition of specified indoor spaces. I'll read that. The term specified indoor spaces shall include all places in the city of Northampton into which members of the public are invited or otherwise allowed to enter a building or structure to interact with any persons in order to trans transact any public or private business and shall include but not be limited to restaurants, bars, indoor performance and event venues, hotels and motels, gyms, fitness clubs, salons, places of worship, indoor workplaces, and common areas of multi-unit buildings. Um, so I'd like to discuss that. So that's section three, number one, about specified indoor spaces with the definition of specified indoor spaces. Um, board members have any comments about that draft language? Cynthia? Yeah, I, um, I'm wondering if um, after listening to public comment about elevators in, in multi-use spaces, if we should um, call out elevators specifically. Um, I just don't know what, what the thinking is on that um, because I thought that so was a the good way. Uh -huh, the, yes, but the draft is common areas of multi-unit buildings. In my mind, elevators would be included in that. Um, does anyone else feel like you want to spell that out? I I would say that I mean it's it's a no brainer because next thing you know you have the laundry room. I mean, I understand the elevator is a good illustrative example, but it seems to me that it's pretty clear it's a common area. Unless other disagree. Yeah, we could get into listing everything, and that gets difficult. Um, any other comments about this list? Restaurants, bars indoor performance and event venues, hotels, motels, gyms, fitness clubs, salons, places of worship, indoor workplaces. We had some discussion about that in the past um, and common areas of multi-unit buildings. Any other discussion about this list? Um, I, I was wondering, sorry, go ahead, Susan. Um, I, I remember that our previous definition was broader. And as I'm looking at this, what is not included in this in this group as far as a uh, a building accessible to the public 
Um, and I say that because I think when we start listing places, it becomes more confusing for the public than if it's just a general regulation that people understand and carry with them. So what's not in I, it? I think it's the other way around. I think when we called them public indoor spaces, it limited us to public spaces. And here we're including places like indoor workplaces, which may not be public. So this is offices, warehouses that would not fall necessarily in the public space. Uh, also okay. the common areas of multi-unit buildings, they may not be public. You may need a key to get in and yet they're common areas. So I think actually this is broader than the way the language we had last time. I do fear, however, that there are things that we might be missing. Um, I can't come up with any, yeah. anybody I else? I, I, pre I appreciate that, that there were limitations to our previous definition. That was my starting place. I guess where we are now, um, is there a broader term to talk about places that are accessible to the public and indoor workplaces and common areas of multi-unit buildings? I just, I do worry about what you said, Joanne, that at this point, we don't know what we're missing, and it it's such a long process for us to catch up to what we've missed. Um, so I, I, I'm just trying to consider whether all of those that are listed before indoor workplaces can be included under an uh, inclusive term. So maybe we could put in somewhere here the term public indoor spaces, including but not limited to, and include those specified places so that we're sure they're included. Yeah, or, or in, indoor places accessible to the public, and then add, and the examples are great, and then in addition, indoor workplaces and common areas of multi-unit buildings. Okay. I think Any other comments? I think what you've said about making these examples rather than inclusive is, is a big step forward. Okay. Any other comments? Is there anything anyone thinks should come out of this list? Um, okay, would anyone like to make a motion? Sorry, can I just ask what we mean by salons? Nail salons, or am I missing other things? It's just in general, all salons, hair, nail, massage. Personal care. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a tattoo parlor would fall in that category? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the, the definition I feel is so broad stroke that it covers everything that I can't think of something that's not included here. Um, if I go and see the therapist, mm -hmm. where does it fall in? Or if I go and take a music lesson? Well, we didn't. Uh, so I think to uh, Suzanne's point, maybe we put examples are instead of in, in, uh, limit, uh, excuse me, included, but not limited to. These are, we couldn't, we can't go and list everything, but I think the definition itself speaks for, for that, Laurent. Yes. There are all kinds of retail establishments that yeah. are included in this list, um, and those are important to include. So would, would changing the sentence here, examples below are, but aren't limited to, is, is that, would that cover well, your I, concerns? I think we can make the work on the wording of it and, and um, make a vote on the um, Essence intention. of it that we're going to, yes, on the intention that we're going to include in the language somewhere public indoor spaces, and these would be examples. And then the things that may not fall under that, we would specify, such as indoor workplaces, common areas of multi unit buildings. Uh, we, retail would be an example of the above. Um, so, uh, does anyone want to make a motion about this section? Um, can we move 
to approve the definition of the definitions under the specified indoor spaces paragraph uh, with the, the intent of this language, because I'm not sure how to word it if we're just voting on the intent. Well, I'd like to, um, I think perhaps we should be voting on number one of section three, masks or face covering shall be worn in all specified indoor spaces in the city of Northampton. And that's a change from how it was previously. And the definition of specified indoor spaces with the intent as discussed or something like that. Okay, if it's permissible to, to lump those together. I think that's reasonable. Okay. And just, so a, we, uh, 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 just a quick question. Um, do we regard um, an automotive repair facility with an open bay as indoor or outdoor? Meredith? Um, so an indoor space that we've defined in other regulations is something that has, um, and even actually last surge, uh, DPH defined it as three walls or more. So if it was just, if it was two walls and two openings, then it wouldn't be considered indoor space. It would be considered an outdoor space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe that's, um, maybe that's something to include in the definitions. Okay. Um, Suzanne, do you wanna try again your motion? <laughs> okay. Um, move to approve um, the, um, I'm having difficulty navigating through this document. Um, I think maybe um, just move to approve section three Yeah. Um, under policies and procedures number one. Yeah, thank you. And, and the definition of specified indoor specified indoor spaces um, with the um, broadening of the definition as we discussed. Meredith, is that an acceptable uh, motion if we uh, wordsmith the language later? Yes. I'll second Thank that. You, Thank you. Um, any other discussion about this section? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move on to bullet number number two under section three. Um, food service establishment employees shall wear a mask or face covering when serving customers, both indoors and outdoors. I think the um, rationale for that is that food um, servers really don't maintain physical distance uh, when they're serving people. Uh, they really come rather close. Um, any discussion about that point? Just to clarify, okay. our, pre our previous definition was indoor spaces only, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Cynthia? Uh, just want to make sure that would include beverage bars. Well, yes, Do they have they have an, a food service establishment permit. Mm -hmm. So it's all um, inclusive. Okay, just want to make sure that's understood too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Known as an FSE. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion um, about this section? Would anyone like to make a motion? 
Motion to approve um, section three, number two, as uh, written. Second. Any, uh, if, thank you. Any further discussion? Any other comments? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. I'm going in the order of boxes on my screen. Joanne, yes. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, number section three, number three. Masks will also be required in crowded outdoor public events where physical distancing cannot be maintained. This includes, but is not limited to, events held at fairgrounds, outdoor performance, and event venues. Um, Meredith, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Uh, yes. Crowded outdoor spaces. What's that? Crowded outdoor spaces. Yep. So some of the events that we have outdoors, um, we know that space is limited or maybe some of the entertainment that they provide. There'll be people who don't live in the same household that are next to each other for periods of time. And what we're trying to do is if you have that type of crowd um, that we wanna make sure that people are masking up. It, this one was challenging when we were drafting this uh, number, bullet number three. Um, and when, we, when I sent this over to attorney Seawald, he said we should be more specific and define what crowded is and actually um, put a number to that. I guess I'm wondering if the comment uh, in that draft that says where physical distancing cannot be maintained, that that's not sufficient. If people are not six feet apart, then does that consider, can that be the definition of crowded? Where or when physical? If you make it where that has to do with the Okay. Venue. Um, do we need to, or do you have a feeling about a number? I don't. A number is an is an artificial. Yeah. Um, criteria. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about the three county fair that's coming up on Labor Day weekend, and I'm thinking about uh, kids sitting on rides that might not be from the same household. Um, I'm thinking about people standing in line to uh, purchase something for pe long periods of time. I think you're, you're including um, households is an important point that needs to be included here because I don't think we intend to have every member of every household standing at least six feet apart. Mm -hmm, correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, physical distancing between household members cannot be maintained. Is that, would that be better? Um, that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what that indicates. Um, it's the distance between household groups, not household members. Oh, between household groups. Okay. Between households. Households, right. Mm -hmm. That's making the assumption the household is vaccinated. The household members are vaccinated, isn't it? It, it, it assumes that they're exposed to each other all the time, whether or not they're vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So are we protecting them? I don't know. It's about the mixing of households, which is higher risk than being within your own household. Yeah. But this was, I mean, this was meant to capture um, large crowds at places versus, you know, just outside again in parks and on the bike path and, you know, in those types of places. I was trying to avoid that, but be inclusive of outdoor weddings. Um, I don't know. 
if it would do more harm than good if we put a number in there? I think we would get caught on that. I, I thought we were moving in the right direction when we talked about defining physical distancing as six feet or more and then exempting members of the same household. Okay. Because at that point, it could be 20, it could be 500. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the space that's available, it might be acceptable or not. But it does say events, so it does not apply to people sitting in the park. Um, anyone want to come up with um, draft language here? I just, I mean, just before that, I just a clarification because we give a definition of performers up on top, but is the assumption of this not of this particular item that this these masks would be need to be worn by performers as well? They're well, down later, we have them exempt the uh, performers. Oh, they're in exemptions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So this is about this is for the public. This is referring mainly to the public attendees. Okay. Um, do we need to say that attendees of these events? Because when I think of the Tri County Fair, it should be vendors too, right? I mean, yeah. So we could just leave it vague like this and exempt the performers later. Yes. Makes okay. Sense. Anybody want to take a crack at the physical distancing or, or defining crowded? Um, tell me why we can't simply delete the word crowded. And also, do we need to define outdoor public event? So I think uh, it's possible to have an event where it's planned and you have people physically distanced and seated. So if they're physically distanced, they would not need to wear a mask. So I think crowded to me means that they can't physically distance or they're not. But I can imagine that there would be an event where they do. But if you said that it's indeed crowded means physical distance cannot yeah. be maintained, therefore we already have that in that sentence. Right. And we are basically saying it's crowded and <laughs> which mm -hmm. means that there's an implication that there could be an outdoor public event that's not crowded, but where physical distance, distancing cannot be maintained. <laughs> well, I, I agree with you. I think that's what <sighs> was giving me pause was that word. I, I, I don't so, think it's helpful. Yeah. So if we took out crowded and we would say at outdoor public events where physical distancing of six feet cannot be maintained between households. Would that work? Uh, between, uh, between. Different households. In individuals of a single household. Between individuals of a different household. I don't know. That's slicing it really thin, don't you I think? I agree. I agree because uh, I mean, if, I, if I have my boyfriend and a girlfriend, they're not in the I same know. household. And I mean, we can't, we're going to ask them to distance themselves. Well, I, I understand. I understand the justification for requiring physical distancing. I think we're going to run into problems with people who live in the same household all the time and um, uh, there's some expectation that they all have to stand at least six feet apart. I, I think that's that's going to be impossible, and people will not be willing to do that. So it, it seems to me intent. we don't necessarily need to worry so much about this because it seems that we're looking at a case where there would be a public outdoor event with people that are generally acquaintances of one another. I mean. What are we trying to say here is there too, that we, we have to mask anyway. We're basically saying you don't have to mask if you're part of the same household at a public indoor event. But since there are other households, there's a presumption there'll be another household, you, you would have to wear a mask. So it doesn't really matter. 
that is the same out everybody they people are several feet one feet apart one foot apart and they still have to wear a mask because there's another household that's probably nearby you're right so i i think we probably yeah. don't need to define it and on top of this you know if it's my best friend or it's, it's i mean this there's always uh I, I don't know. There's something that becomes very pro-family that I, I, I don't like. And I'm, I'm sure there's going to be something that, a case that we completely ignore. And that's perfectly reasonable, like a boyfriend and a girlfriend that are not in the same household. Mm -hmm. but if can, you want to can go we just there, discuss we say household or pod, but I don't think yeah. we need to go there. Mm -hmm. Can we just entertain this for a discussion then? Just forget about that and just um, leave it at outdoor public events where there'll be more than 50 attendees, you shall wear a mask. That's a good one. I don't know why we wouldn't require masks for a group of 40. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I think, I think an, an, a number that we pick out of the air is also not, not helpful. I, I, I agree with Lauren. I, I think the general requirement for masks at outdoor public events is the point we want to make. And I, I don't particularly think it's important whether it's 15 people or 150 people. I think people need to be wearing masks now if they're um, at, at public events where they're, they're grouped together. So Suzanne, would you think to take out the physical distancing uh, clause there? No, and uh, no, I would, I would put that in, um, knowing that that's an aspiration rather than um, a physical possibility. I think by this point, people are used to the concept of six foot physical distancing. There are markers on the ground everywhere and people have participated in this for you know, over a year now. So I, I think the concept of physical distancing is one that, that most people understand pretty clearly. Um, I, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time um, defining that in detail. And we certainly wanna encourage that, but I think more important than that is the masking. Sure, and and so I just I just don't want to get in a situation of okay, I'm six feet, mask on. I'm less than I'm over six feet, mask off. I don't want it, that mask on. Mask so so that's my only reason for suggesting. Do we need the clause? But maybe the wording is um, um, replace crowded with all, and um, not have a limitation of uh, size of the of the event because. I, I'm, I'm worried about ride operators, vendors. I, I want to make sure this is very inclusive for anyone at these events, DJs. <laughs> Would someone like to make a motion? Um, I, w one last thing before we, if, if you don't mind, and then. Sure. Do we need to define outdoor public event? Or at least give some example. So. All right. So if it's the barbecue, yeah. if it's the, the backside, the backyard barbecue of. Um, That's not public. The public the second not, sentence does have examples. The second sentence says this includes, but is not limited to events held at fairgrounds, outdoor performance and event venues. All right. Um, I'll throw this out there. I move to approve um, section three, number three, with eliminating the word crowded. Do you end the six foot? I, I could go either way on that. But it, we could, where six foot physical distancing cannot be maintained is fine or the general concept of physical distancing. Is there a second? I, I, I gave people a choice. That's not, <laughs> that's not really a motion. Uh, well, okay, your motion, my, we'll go with your first motion. My motion was to accept section three, number three, as is with the exception of the word crowded. 
Is there a second? Well, can I amend that? You can make a friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> so I would amend by uh, the six foot and then example of public outdoor public event. I'm sorry, outdoor public event include, but are not limited to. And we use the list um, uh, event on public premises, fairgrounds and so on that was mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's already in number three. So you're saying your amendment is that you would include uh, where six foot physical distancing cannot be maintained to insert six foot? Yes, sorry, I, I didn't see that this include my limited interest. Yes, I would amend us. So crowded is out and my amendment is physical distancing of six, six feet cannot be maintained. Is there a second to the amendment? I'll second it. Any other discussion about the amendment of adding of six feet? Uh, so let's now vote on the amendment of adding six feet. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. So that amendment passes and now we can go to the original motion. Uh, which is to accept number three. Uh, we're taking out the word crowded and we've approved the motion to add six, distancing of six feet. Um, there's a motion on the table. I can't remember if it was seconded. It was not as I recall. I'll second it. Uh, any further discussion about section three, number three? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Okay, number four. Masks. Um, let me read it from here. Masks or face coverings are required when playing the following outdoor high risk team sports including but not limited to football, wrestling, rugby, basketball, lacrosse, ice hockey, competitive cheer, martial arts, ultimate frisbee, boxing, pair figure skating. Uh, Meredith, can you uh, talk a little bit about how this list was chosen? This was, this came right from DPH's um, definition of high risk contact sports and the same with moderate risk contact sports underneath it. So it's verbatim from when they used it at DPH and EEA. So this number four goes with, uh, in section two definition, uh, moderate risk sports and recreational activities are characterized inter by intermittent close proximity or limited incidental physical contact between or among participants. Comments? Um, what is the current DPH recommendation and the NIAA recommendation for masking in these sports? There are none. I, I do think the argument could be made that the sports are not possible if they're masked. I'm not saying that masking is not a good idea. I'm just saying that um, requiring masks could very well eliminate <clears throat> the performance of a number of these uh, high physical activity, but high risk activity, sports activities. Meredith, um, do you know last season, uh, spring or last fall, did it eliminate sports or any of these sports? No, it was a requirement. Um, for the players? For the players, yeah. It was. I yeah. thought it was just for people on the sidelines. No, for the players. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification and correcting me. And the sports, the sports went forward, but mm -hmm. the whole state was under the same rules at that time, right? Yes. Thank, thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments about this? 
And this uh, is. Go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, this is referring um, to sports that are under the um, um, auspices of a school or a recreational program, or how about club, people just club, I'm sorry? Intramur club intramural? So yeah. So um, people doing a, a pickup basketball game um, outside or mm -hmm. um, I, touch football? No, it doesn't doesn't include them. Okay. Um, and um, martial arts and, and pair figure skating are, are, are under the outdoor section and a, a lot of martial arts is indoors. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering why that's outdoors. As is wrestling. As is ice hockey. But... I think they'd be covered by the mask order already by being indoors. They would. Okay. So this adds some of these outdoor sports. And this just covers the teams when they're playing in Northampton. Once they cross town, city line uh, and play in another community, it doesn't cover them there. Is it correct that this would make Northampton the only site where this is required? That is correct. So and I do understand or... the athletic director's concerns about it. Um, you know, Meredith or Vivian, can you um, talk about um, clusters that you saw last year in sports? Viv? I will say the, the clusters that we personally dealt with here in Northampton were with our indoor high risk sports. Um, and what's difficult with sports clusters as well is it can be difficult to determine if transmission's happening on the field or you know other playing space or if it's happening on the sidelines, if it's happening in the locker rooms, if it's happening in social activities around the sport. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at DPH's cluster data, so that's Northampton data, but uh, DPH's cluster data for many, many weeks during the um, sports season, whatever that, that sport may be, you would see uh, clusters being relatively high. And it wasn't, again, just people playing the sport. Sometimes it was because they were congregating after the team sport was done too. So it was really challenged, challenging to identify if it was when they actually were performing or, or after. And we don't have excellent data from last fall because I, they were moved to the spring. We're not running yeah. fall. Last fall, the sports, the fall sports were moved to the spring. They were canceled in the fall. If I remember correctly. So um, right now, number four talks about when playing. Um, and then number five talks about dugouts, benches, seating areas. Um, does that cover all the, it doesn't really say locker rooms. I guess locker rooms are indoors and are already covered. Mm -hmm. um, does that cover all the congregating that you might see, Vivian? If you, can you think of anything that's missing from this? Um, that would cover, and I just kind of realized that we're not, we should, be putting um, the high risk sports under that as well. So that's clear that it's moderate and high risk. Um, I think that would cover all the areas because common seating areas would also include spectators based on how it's currently worded. No, no, because we're talking about um, team sports. So it's the act of, you know, playing the sport it doesn't include the spectators. Um, you know, much to um, I, the, the athletic director's comments, I mean, maybe we should consider doing um, high risk and moderate risk sports, just having masks be worn in the dugouts, benches and other common seating areas for now. And we watch to see if there's any trends or clusters that mm -hmm. happen, you know, um, it, 
the data for outdoor transmission is is slim. I know we're dealing with a totally different beast right now. Delta is way more transmissible than our prior variants that we had. Um, so I, I think we should really take that into consideration what he had to say. I agree with that. So we have number four and number five. Again, these are just some suggestions. We don't need to take them. Number four refers to outdoor high-risk contact sports and masks are required when playing. And number five refers to masks be worn in the dugout benches and other common seating areas for outdoor <laughs> moderate risk sports. We could add moderate and high-risk sports. And there's a list of sports and also up on, pay on the second section, um, we have definitions. A team sport involve, includes any sport which involves players working together towards a shared objective. A team sport is an activity in which a group of individuals on the same team work together to accomplish an ultimate goal. Moderate risk sports and recreational activities are characterized in, by intermittent close proximity or limited incidental physical contact between participants. And high risk sports and recreational activities are characterized by a requirement or a substantial likelihood of routine, close, and or sustained proximity or deliberate physical contact between or among participants and a high probability that respiratory particles will be transmitted between or among participants. And the list we have for high risk, the list I read, football, wrestling, rugby, basketball, lacrosse, ice hockey, competitive cheer, martial arts, ultimate frisbee, boxing, and paired figure skating. The moderate risk list where it might be incidental or occasional contact would be baseball, softball, track and field, volleyball, soccer, running club, team swimming, volleyball, dance class, fencing, field hockey, and soccer. And again, this numbers four and five refer to outdoors because I think all these sports would be covered um, on our indoor masking policy. And does it warrant to be a reminded that it's, um, if the, I, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out if you wrestling indoor, presumably would be indoor, you still have to wear a mask in that case. Does it need to be reminded? I don't think so. <laughs> this is for outdoor wrestling. All right. <laughs> okay. So for our list of indoor spaces, we did not specifically say school, but it's a public indoor space. So anywhere in a school where sports are happening would be included. Do we want to put school back in our specified indoor spaces? No. Not necessary? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, they're under mask mandate anyway by the state right now, but um okay any other comments about section yeah. four and five i i was listening carefully to the athletic director's comments and i'm trying to weigh that against the explosive growth of of this particular variant and that younger people are at higher risk um because of the proportion vaccinated or unvaccinated I, I think though that um, I think we could revisit the, the um, players themselves during the sport if we see evidence of spread within them at a later date. Any other comments? Yeah. Questions four and five? I would agree with um, Suzanne, because I think basically what we're doing here is we are saying, if you play, you don't have to wear a mask. I think that's really our only change. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some of these sports, which I think I just don't know, are in middle school or in this clubs where the individuals who are playing the sport are not vaccine eligible. So I just want to caution us that that's what we're saying. If you want to play, 
you you don't have to wear a mask. So there's a there's a vulnerability there. I'm I'm not recommending okay we need to mask up, but um, this is the direction that we're going in, and I think we have to have some kind of a a watch on this. Um, in um, community colleges, for example, in Massachusetts, which are not requiring a vaccination, are requiring athletes to be vaccinated. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying it's a different kind of um, approach criteria. So to support Suzanne's would it, statement. Would it make sense to, for number four, about the high-risk contact sports, to make a difference between vaccine eligible ages and vaccine not eligible ages. So in the group that are less than 12 and the group over 12, even though we know everyone's not vaccinated, because do they have a different risk? I don't think we can go there because we're not determining vaccination status of anyone. So for all we know, um, people um, 15 and older playing these sports may all be vaccinated or not vaccinated. We're not, we're not determining that or monitoring that. So I think we have to um, just go by the location of people and their activities within that location. But I think Joanne was recommending 12 and under masks, not vaccination, if you're participating in a sport. Because we know all those folks are not vaccinated. So, any other discussion about sections four and five and the definitions that go with them? Would anyone like to make a motion? Um, I can give it a shot. Motion to merge four and five into a single paragraph that reads, mask must be worn in the dugout benches and other common air, common seating areas for outdoor high risk, moderate risk contact team sports included but not limited to, and the list of the various sports follow. So basically, you're eliminating number four and having number five include moderate and high risk. That's correct. Okay. Uh, with the two lists, because that, that list that's on there on number five is only the moderate risk. We can add the high risk list. Correct. Okay. Uh, is there a second? A second. Second by Suzanne. Thank you. Any further discussion? So what we're saying here is that we are eliminating the masks for outdoor high-risk contact sports for now. And that is an area where we might consider <coughs> revisiting. Um, but we would like to include dugouts, benches, and common seating areas. Um, any other discussion of this item? Yeah, I would like to... Um echo what Cynthia said. I think we have to have an extraordinarily high sensitivity or any transmission or evidence of transmission um, it, at sporting events or among athletes and move very quickly um, in that case. Uh, this gives me a lot of pause, um, but I, I think if hopefully we'll get some advance warning. And I'm talking about clusters, not only in Northampton, but elsewhere. And um, um, Vivian, are you still on? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, at least last year during the academic year, um, there were weekly meetings that went over what people were seeing specifically in sports transmission for COVID-19 across the state, um, which were you know, pretty helpful and uh, assessing risk levels for different sports. So I don't know if that's gonna be happening again, but I can certainly look into that. That would be very helpful, when, thank you. 
When you do contact tracing, um, do you ask about uh, team sports? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, we, and we work really closely with the schools too. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to identify um, spread ideally before it happens. So identify if a case worked, uh, no, sorry, worked, um, practiced or played with a team sport um, while they were infectious or if maybe there was exposure that happened um, with the team sport during their incubation period. So um, and, and we do take it seriously, especially um, when in any case has been at school or in an extracurricular activity like a sport. Thank you. I just want to note that uh, Mr. Prue from the athletics department uh, put in the chat. Um, you can also have a carve out for high school and college athletics such as Smith since their governing bodies are working with medical personnel to determine their masking requirements, which is not happening at the youth level. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, so there's a motion on the table. Um, any other discussion of the motion? Um, Let's take it to a vote. Uh, Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Suzanne? Yes. Thank you. Joanne? Yes. OK, that motion passes. Um, which ultimately means taking out number four. Um, number five is very similar to what we had before um, with a few additions. All masks and face coverings worn in accordance with this order shall conform to the following. Sit snugly but comfortably. Be secured with ties or ear loops. Include multiple layers of fabric. Allow for breathing without restriction. I think it took out cotton and took out... Um, having to be launderable, maybe removed for eating, drinking where allowed. And we added disposable surgical procedure masks, N95 and elastomeric masks and cloth masks are permitted. Um, any discussion about that change? Would someone like to make a motion? I'm, I'm quickly looking at the difference, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, no, 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 secured. We took out must be able to be laundered. Was there an and issue with some, the? Go ahead. No, and and um, added some things to the disposables to that last line. Go ahead, what was your question? Oh, was there an issue with respect to like some sort of valve system on some masks or is this something that's just too complicated? Yeah, people do use masks, less and less so, but occasionally they'll have a valve which allows them to exhale. Those are typically construction masks which allows them to exhale but not inhale. And that certainly puts people around them at risk. Um, I don't know if it's worth putting in there or not. Um, any other discussion about this section? Why not put that in? That masks with exhale valves are not permitted? So, so I'll conform to the following. Um, not, not have exhale valves. H. Would someone like to make a motion? Are we including that or not? Uh, depends who makes the motion. Um, uh, I move to approve five as written with the addition of H not have exhale valves. I second that motion. Any further discussion? Uh, 
if there's no more discussion, uh, we'll put that to a vote. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so now I'd like to go through the exemptions. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the first paragraph is unchanged. The first little paragraph. Uh, number one, we changed age five to age two as con being consistent with uh, the CDC guidelines. Um, I don't know if you want to go through these one at a time or all together. Um, we could probably do them all. Um, I'm getting my pages confused. Number four is also in addition to uh, face coverings are not required and shall not be worn when actively participating in water-based activities and when swimming. So in this section, there right. was only two changes. Number one, we changed the age and then we added number four. Oh, but I think number no. two, we also added, uh, employees in shared office spaces are not required to mask if social distancing can be maintained. And uh, we, yeah, we've changed two and three. Also and three, right. We expanded yeah. three. Yeah, there are changes. Yeah, let's do one at a time. Okay. Let's just discuss them one at a time. Number one, we just changed the age from five to two. Who needs to wear a mask? Any discussion of that? Nope. And, go ahead. Uh, number two, employees in shared office spaces are not required to mask if social distancing can be maintained. We said this because up in the first section or whichever section that was about indoor workspaces, we hadn't really included office space previously because they're not necessarily public. But in the new definition, we're including indoor workspaces, which include offices and warehouses and places like that. Um, but certainly if people are in private offices they do not need to mask. And we said if they're in shared offices, they are not required to mask if social distancing can be maintained. We didn't say exactly six feet. I don't know if you want to put that in there. Any discussion of that? Uh, so number three for performers. Previously, we just mentioned singing or playing brass or wind instruments. And here we've added performing live theater or presenting or speaking at an event are not required to wear face coverings. Those must adhere to a social distancing of at least 10 feet um, from any member of the public when performing indoors. Um, there was a comment from um, the public. I think I wrote down um, that there was a plea to include actors, dancers, and circus performers. And I think I may be missing one other category that was proposed. Um, it was, so, what did you have? I have actors, mm -hmm. dancers, and cir circus performers. And I had actors, dancers, circus, yeah. <laughs> Would those not fall under performing live theater? I would say yes. I don't know. I'm not in live theater. <laughs> Do we want to specify? Such as actors. Can it be performing, performing arts? Performing actors, live dancers, theater. and circus performers. Which is so, such as, or who are presenting or speaking at an event are not required to wear face coverings, so but must adhere to social distancing of at least 10 feet. Many of the member of the public when performing indoors, I question if we should also do that outdoors, that they should be 10 feet away. I don't know if that should be only indoors. They're um, exempt, but do we want to keep some distance? Um, I, 
in my opinion, this is fine as it is. Performing live theater, I think, is broad enough, unless we, I, I, I'm not inclined to say outdoor. Uh, it is the only change that I would make to number three is whether we want to give example of what live theater means uh, or whether we should say something like including actors, dancers, circus performers, and other performing artists. Uh, that's pretty much the only change that I would have. The rest is fine. So Vivian, where you have performing arts, that would be such as? Yes. Such as actors, dancers, circus performers. And other performing, performer and art, performance other performing artists. Art. Or just say performance artist, that just seems to cover it to me. I prefer the general term in this case. Performance, performance artist. artist. That actually covers performing live theater as well. No one wants to keep uh, 10 feet of distance between singers and brass instruments, even outdoors? I, I would agree with you, Joanne. I think we should put in outdoors. It just gives it some clarity. Uh, so just the very last, um, I would just take out indoors because it would apply to both indoors and outdoors or add outdoors, indoors and outdoors, however you'd like to do it. Okay. Doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> okay. Any other discussion about this? Uh, oh, yes. Then the number four is about um, that face coverings are not required when swimming because this is a um, drowning risk. Face coverings shall be worn at all times when not in the water, including but not limited to indoor pool decks, locker rooms, changing rooms, and restrooms. Any comments about that section? All good to me. All right, so we've uh, made some changes to one, two, three, and four as is. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? I'm, ha I'm happy to try. And with the understanding, remind me, only three was being mo modified, right? Uh, number one, we changed age five from the original document oh, yeah, to yeah. age two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number two, uh, we added six feet or more to clarify social distancing. Number three, we added performing arts and outdoors. Okay. And number four was not in the original document, but uh, we've not talked about changing this draft. Our motion to approve uh, section four with section one, um, lowering the age from five to two. Um, paragraph two, uh, adding social distances of six feet can be maintained. Number three, um, uh, changing performing uh, live theater to uh, performance artists um, and um, removing the performing indoor clause at the end and uh, including paragraph four as uh, shown. Um, Vivian, would you, in number three, would you take out uh, performing live theater and just leave in performing artists? I think performing artists is inclusive of live theater. Right, so we can take out performing live theater. Yep. Then. Okay. Artists. Yep. Um, Lawrence, there was a, um, the way we just amended it as number three, we added outdoors instead of taking off the indoors. Yeah, yeah that's you, fine. Is that acceptable? Yes, okay. it, it, yes I, I, I will motion like that. <laughs> um, is there a second? A second. Thank you. You're late, you have to go. Um, <laughs> any other discussion? Any other discussion? This is section four of the draft document. All right, we'll take it to a vote. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? 
Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Levin, I'm going to yeah. uh, leave and I just want to make sure everyone knows that we still will have a quorum, I think. So I believe so. We have just three wanna, out of four. I believe so. And want to confirm that. Um, Meredith, are you still here? Yes. Do we we still have a quorum. quorum if yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you. So sorry I had to leave. All right. And the section five is, uh, I believe it's the same. Section, section six, um, I'd like Meredith to speak to. There was some concern about this being an open ended uh, math mandate without an end date or condition, end condition. Um, Meredith, do you want to talk about this metric? Yes. So um, that was one of our many comments that we had after we passed the order two weeks ago that um, there wasn't any type of metric send when we were going to rescind this. Um, before our orders were rescinded at the end of the public health emergency. Um, so there was an end date. So Vivian and I were talking about what would be an adequate metric to lift the order. And when we were looking at our data, when we lifted the order last time, we were looking at our incident rate and we felt like that would be a good starting point for this order to be lifted, but not only the incident rate here in Northampton, but also on the county. And we just don't wanna look at that rate for one or two weeks because it could be very inconsistent depending on what happened. We wanna look at a longer um, time frame. We wanna look at the trend to see if it's consistently going down. So we felt four weeks would be a good marker. So if we had an incident rate below three cases per day for four consecutive weeks, I think it would be safe to say that, um, you know, community transmission risk is, is pretty low at that point and we could be at the point where we could lift this order. Thank you. Any yes, do questions? you have anything to add? Vivian? Um, that captured it. Um, and just for some perspective here too, I mean, we had such a lull in cases that our incident rate for Northampton was Below one and more than and one, more than one occasion, just zero per a hundred thousand. Um, so the fact that now we're back up to you know twelve cases per day per hundred thousand points to the transmission that we're seeing here. Um, but we also know that we can you know realistically get back to this pretty realistically get back to a point where we have below three cases per day per hundred thousand in both the city and the county. Do you think that's low enough? I guess my concern is about lifting it too early. Um, I think that if it was going below that, maybe we would also want to see, if anything, evidence of continued decline, like not just hovering around three. But that would be the only thing I would add, if that makes sense. A downward trend? Yeah. Over a month? Like not just sitting at, because three cases per day per 100,000. I mean, that's, you know, for CDC metrics, still low risk, but we know that that could still go up, especially if surrounding counties are continuing to have pretty high trends. But isn't it correct that if, if the rate goes above that, then these orders stay in force? Right, so we have we have nothing saying there that if we had a rate below that for four consecutive weeks and lifted this and then on week five, we went above that again. We, we don't really have anything there saying that we'd have to step back. I, I guess I was assuming that if the rate went up that the order would be, re, would be back in force. I was making that assumption, maybe I'm not correct, that that these these orders are only lifted under this circumstance, otherwise they're in force. But that's just my assumption, it may be wrong. 
I wouldn't want to have that as a caveat. Like if we did lift the order after four weeks of consecutive um, low incidence rate of under three, and then on week six, we went above three again, that this automatically comes into effect because it could be one cluster event that puts us there. So I would rather if once rescinded, if we were going to, um, and enact the order again, I'd rather have a Board of Health meeting to discuss what we're seeing in terms of data and trends. That, that makes sense. So yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about this happening automatically. Is that the intent here, that this would happen automatically when we met those criteria, this um, order would no longer be enforced? I would, I would rather say that we will meet to discuss um, when that the, these are the general criteria that the board would use to just you know to make a decision but that this would not be automatic i mean people i think want to know generally what are we looking for but i, I i'm very hesitant to have it be automatic because put it out of our control and can i ask another question is um let's say we never achieve this for a reason that um, there's a different mutation that the vaccine is not controlled. Are we bound by this or can we simply change it at our own discretion? If let's say the entire country or the side decide to handle this in a different way. In other words, can it be more general or at the discretion of the board, something like this? Well, we, we could do an amendment to the order. So okay. we have we have that. But, may, but maybe having under this section that the board will convene to discuss lifting of the order. I like that better that um, when these metrics are met, the board will, will consider lifting the order or something like that. Well, can we not say when those metrics are met can we put those metrics and say the board will? Because I, 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 again, I'm just wondering what if those metrics are never met? Doesn't mean we can't convene and discuss it before that. It just means that when this is met, we will convene. Maybe not the day of, right? But what if it's intent, if it's something that stays, it becomes like the flu in the long term. Um, do we want to have this? Because that could be set, that that makes it something that can never be lifted. What I'm trying to say is, can we put a wiggle criteria, some sort of other criteria, or that it can be the discretion? I don't want to be held to something that may be impossible to achieve. I don't think this this prevents us from lifting it at any other time. I okay, but can we say this? As... This does not prevent us from li lifting mm -hmm. it at any other time. Well, the language or is... at the or at the discretion of the board at any time. Yes, something like yeah. Yes. So why do we need these criteria? that informational for the public or we're not really bound to this? I, I, I'm just trying to figure out whether if it's here to stay, does this mean we are saying essentially we're gonna be wearing masks forever and ever as opposed to oh. we'll be managing this differently if it becomes more like the flu? Yeah, there's some thought that uh, we'll be masking every winter. I don't know. If Some people have... think that. What's that, Vivian? I, just, I don't know if we have the answer to that now. And if it's honestly, it's just kind of um, so theoretical at this point. So if we don't have the answer, um, I, I, I don't want to have that criteria being wishful thinking which is why I would want to add or the discussion of the board. 
unless I'm totally overthinking it and we can always come up with orders that quash the prior order. I just don't want to be held with a matrix that is impossible to achieve and, and force people to mass forever and ever. Well, we've achieved it before. Yeah, but again, you know, past performance is not a prediction of future ones. <laughs> well, and, but we, uh, this is, it's all hypothetical. I don't think we can address hypotheticals. Um, I, I don't think we should put in the metrics. I think we should just say the board will meet regularly and review local uh, metrics or local statistics and um, review this, um, you know, and consider lifting this order as appropriate. I don't know. Meredith, do you feeling strongly that we need to have a number in here? I don't. I think it was just more for the general public, giving them um, sight on an end date of it. Well, how about the board will consider a criteria such as to at least give a, a sense for what we're looking at, but not being held by it. How about something like the board will meet regularly and review local statistics? The board will review metrics such as, uh, look to metrics such as those below in considering this mask order. Well, I Something mean, if like this that? is the case, if we're not setting a metric, I'd rather just take it out in its entirety. Right. I mean, that's a given. Right. That's, that's our role. That's what we do yeah. all the time. Right. I don't think there's a need to state that explicitly. That's why we're meeting tonight. All right. Mm -hmm. Then I would take it out. Any other discussion? Um, so the consensus seems to be taking it out. This was not in the original document, so we don't really need to vote on it unless someone wants to make a motion to leave it, to put this in. I just wanted to ask Meredith clarification. How helpful is it for you and the staff to have these metrics spelled out? I it's, understand. I understand it's not at all. We look, we look at the data daily. Thank you. If, yeah. Okay, awesome. We're moving right along. So on section seven, um, the original order went into effect on August 11th. So now we'd like to look at the document as a whole. We've made um, changes to, if I can find it, to all kinds of things in here. Um, but there are some other changes on this draft that I just want to point out if maybe we'd have a vote to sort of change everything in here. Um, we've changed the title of the policy uh, to not say that it's uh, involving public indoor spaces. It's just the wearing of masks or other face coverings in the city of Northampton. Um, in the whereas section, 98% uh, of positive cases are, are um, Delta variants. That's data that um, Meredith or Vivian put in, unfortunately. Um, now, therefore, just in the bottom of this section, um, policies and procedures must be implemented. That was, um, was that an Alan Seawald edition, Meredith? I can't tell you. I think the only thing we, I thought the only thing that we changed was all, uh, specified, specified indoor spaces in that now, therefore, okay. sentence. Okay. Um, and then we voted on each of the sections. Um, and then the very last section, uh, we've, we've not accepted section six. Um, section seven, do we want to, it was uh, amended would be today's date, effective date. Anybody? Um, sorry, can we go back to now therefore? So the prior language must be implemented at all times at all public indoor spaces in the city of Northampton. Is Specified now indoor spaces. 
Yeah, the previous version was at all public indoor spaces. So right now it's at all specified indoor. It's no longer public, it's specified, right? Oh, indoor. Right, but under the, uh, under the specified, we added, I can't find my page. We added public indoor spaces in the list, such as, and then we have listed some of them. So no, and, I'm, 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 I'm good, mm -hmm. sorry. To the extent yeah. we remove indoor at the at all specified spaces and indoor mm -hmm. is out, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks for catching that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we have the beginning. There's a little bit of change, and then the end. Would when would we like the effective date of this? I, I, I'm, I'm actually bringing this up out of out of place, but I apologize for that. I was asked. Uh -huh. I was asked about um, masking and distancing among performers, and I, I put some thought to that. And I, I think that ought not to be included. That that should be the discretion of the individual performers, just as it is for anyone in any group that they choose to gather in. Our, our job is, is to protect the public. Yeah, it's not included. Yeah, I, that's what I was asked about it. Oh, uh, okay. Someone asked, but what? But what about among performers? Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I and I thought about this, and I I think that, that falls under the same um, principle as people who choose to gather with others for whatever event. Our our job is not to prevent families from transmitting to each other if they choose to be among each other we can make recommendations but i think that um that's an individual decision and should not be part of this so suzanne uh, uh, partly to your point and partly for other reasons i thought when we're done with this document that we should have put out a health advisory because even though things are permitted it doesn't mean they're good um they're safe Right, bars yeah. and restaurants, I mean, whatever. Exactly. So uh, at the yes. bottom of this document, I wrote, we wrote a health advisory, which we can look at after we finish this document. Mm -hmm. um, but just a basic comment on, you know, be careful if you're in, in public indoor spaces, gatherings of individuals other than your households or crowded outdoor spaces. I, and that's just sort of a public advisory. Right, I looked, um, at, the, I looked at the CDC guidance and CDC actually recommends that indoor performances be postponed. Um, that's just a recommendation. Um, but I don't think we're at a position to do that. It's not what we're talking about here. I do think that it's our job to inform the public of risk, even if we don't outlaw things. And so I would like to work on maybe for next time, a bunch of health advisories and comments and we can use the CDC or DPH as our guide. Um, because I think a lot of people think if these things are open, that means they're safe. Um, so, but can we, uh, we digress. Um, can we finish this document? Who would like to propose an effective date? Um, how about August 27th? As in tomorrow. Well, that's in like, that's in five hours. Okay. I then, think we need to give some time and warning to the public. Okay, well then, uh, then we come upon the weekend. That was one reason I was thinking about tomorrow. Well, then it would be have to be Monday at the earliest. It, can, can it be like we, when, when did we do last, what did we do last time? We, we talked on a Monday and it was effective Wednesday at 12.01, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a day it, and a half later. Can it be effective on Saturday at 12.01? Certainly. Okay. Well, I just need time to get a press release out and notify mm -hmm. the public. Well, so, <laughs> it, I mean, is, is, is this something you can do or do you need until Tuesday, 12.01? I, I can get it out tomorrow. I, I think Monday would be great. It would just... Okay. Give, a little um, more time. The date, Monday, let's see. The 30th. Monday's the 30th. 
Monday, unless there's any big events happening this weekend that you want this in place for? Is the Three County Fair happening this weekend? No. Um, no. Monday the 30th at 1201 AM. So would someone like to make a motion uh, to accept the changes in the draft document, including all the motions that were accepted earlier and changes to the um, beginning section and final section and an effective date? Uh, uh, just just a quick question. Just a quick question. I'm sorry. Um, I, I know it's amended. Um, Today, effective effective day twelve oh one. It that do we need to also change the date of that was um, now therefore commencing on on the first page? Does it become August August thirtieth? No. It does not. It does not. Okay. Because these are amendments. Mm-hmm. Well, then I, I propose um, that we adopt these regulations, whatever the title is, I can't see the title, as amended. Move to do that. And I will second that. And any other discussion about that? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Joanne, yes, that, that is approved. Thank you all, that was not so easy. <laughs> it was a lot of detail work, uh, but thank you. I think we uh, came out with a good document. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, we covered definition of performers, indoor pools, metrics. Um, we didn't talk about, um, on when to wear masks at restaurants and bars. Meredith, do you need anything more about that? No, not at this time. Okay. All right. Um, is there anything else about the mask order that anyone wants to bring up? Is there anything we didn't touch on? Okay. Cynthia, there's no public um, comment at this time. Yeah, this is just directed to board members. Sorry. Um, um, I think Kelly I'm might. Late. We did DocuSign work, work for everybody to get this signed last time? Yes. yes. I think it did. It did. It just took a little while. Okay, so I'll I'll make all the changes tomorrow, and then you can expect it in your inboxes by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, okay, Great. thank you. Uh, let's look at minutes. Um, we have minutes June 17th that Lawrence amended. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for spelling out, out all of those things and, and improving the language. Um, does everyone have the latest version of June 17th minutes? Um, I have seen the latest version and I'm um, fine with them. Anybody else have any comments or questions about the minutes from June 17th? Um, I sent in a couple minor edits. I don't know, does, Kelly, does this document include those or was I too late? So was that the ones you sent in this afternoon? I sent was it that... in, no, I sent it in this morning before I went to work. Okay, was that for the 9th or the June 17th? I first, first, actually, I think I sent June 17th, yes, last night, and then I sent for the 9th this morning. Okay, I think I only saw one, one of those. Okay, they, they were minor. It's, 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 it's not critical to go revisit them. I'll look at, the, I'll look at email and look and check. Thank you. Does someone want to make a motion about June 17th minutes? Move to approve the minutes from June 17th. Um, then I'll second that. 
Any other discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Make for a quick roll call. <laughs> um, okay, minutes from the ninth. I think there were some changes. So, uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I, I'm, I'm good with the changes. It's, it's up to Susan to decide. Um, I, I, I think what I sent in was minor. I, I'm not going to take the time to go in here and see if my minor edits are included. I'm, I'm fine with it. All right. Okay. Motion? Uh, move to approve the minutes from August 9th. In second. All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Joanne, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I don't know um, if you guys want to write, uh, accept a health advisory. Vivian, are you still here? No, I told her she could go, Joanne. Oh, because it was at the bottom of the document. Uh, we had written out a health advisory, which would be something, I don't know, on our website. Um, I'm not sure where else it would go. Um, being unmasked in public indoor spaces or in gatherings of individuals other than your own household or in crowded outdoor spaces where social distancing cannot be maintained may increase your risk of contracting COVID-19. Do you think that has any value? Sure. I mean, to put up on the website, sure, that's fine. I think it's fine as well. I think um, Vivian added, uh, all individuals are urged to vigilantly monitor themselves for new symptoms of illness. Doesn't say what to do if you find illness. Thoughts? I think both of these statements are are broad and general and non-controversial and fine. Okay. <laughs> Lauren? I, I, the health I, advisory uh, to, to put on our website? I'm fine with that. Does this require a motion or no? If it's an no. advisory, no? Mm -hmm. no? Okay. All right. Um, Meredith, do you have any other business? I don't. That's it for tonight. Anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Anything else for our next agenda? We wanted to have um, something about pesticides next time, right? And are we meeting mm -hmm. on September 9th? Is that the 9th? That's Is that because we can't meet at our regular scheduled right. Board of Health meeting? Okay. It's Yom Kippur. Yeah. And I'm keep over. Okay. No school. Good. All right. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Mm, I will second. Any other discussion? Um, all in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you for the members of the public who joined us. Thank you uh, everyone for participating and helping us. And um, thank you uh, DPH staff for keeping us healthy. Yeah. Thank, for thanks, trying to. Thanks Joanne and <laughs> Meredith, you obviously, and Vivian, you obviously, obviously did a lot of work on our behalf. So thank you. All right. Yeah, thank it's you everyone. To have something, something to look at to, to start with, right? But it was, it was um, very helpful. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Stay well. You too.